the liquefied natural gas proposal, should we not be able to stop it? Um, could it be rescinded and it, can it be transferred from one to another? I mean, this, there's a Caribbean company that owns it now, but could it be sold to Exxon where it could be sort of put on steroids and made into a massive facility? What, what are the options out there? <laughs> the, um, so the interesting thing about these ports and these facilities, as we've seen in Cove Point, they have an existing facility, they're making it bigger and they're repurposing it. Liberty Natural Gas, if built, these licenses, and this is true for a lot of federal licenses because of these antiquated legal systems, once you have the license, it's really up to the federal government to how that license gets used. On the Deepwater Port Act, Liberty Natural Gas's license is forever. And to transfer owners, if this Cayman Island bank account wants to sell it to BP or Exxon, all they have to do is let the government know and the government signs off on it and none of that is made public. None of that is reviewable, none of that is, is subject to comment from the people. If they, wanna, if they have two buoys right now that they're saying they're going to use for imports, if they want to make it four for exports, none of that is reviewable. They write a letter to the government, the government approves it, and it happens without our input. So too many of these things, once you put an industrial toehold, or a foothold in this case, or for here it's a Sasquatch foothold, um, in our offshore ocean environment, or anywhere really, uh, for a bad idea that's built under a legal system that doesn't provide for any uh, breaks on it becoming a worse idea is that you just run the risk of a, of a lifetime of problems. Uh, so these ports off of Boston, they were built, they're there, they're going to be there for forever. It's a buoy, they brought it down to the seafloor, they're just going to wait for the time is right to make their money. And then they're going to reopen those ports and bring in shipments or send out shipments because these licenses are forever. Dominion Co. Point took up a huge swath of Maryland's Chesapeake Bay estuary. Um, and when imports started declining, they said, let's add on a massive other swath right next door because we already own that land. We actually said that we were gonna preserve that wetland, so you let us pave over the first one, but now we wanna pave over that one, but don't worry, we'll buy up some Louisiana. Um, they're using that next door neighbor part of land so that they can expand their industrial footprint. So these, these toeholds are a very bad idea, especially when the legal system is such that it provides no check on the progress of industry. And so knowing that right now, and it's important to tell governors that, because a lot of people don't know that that's the case, is, is spreading the word, is, is talking about it with your friends and your colleagues, because that's something that once people know, they say, this isn't a good idea, why are we doing this? This makes no sense. Or at least let's talk about it more. Well, if the governor was doing the, the DEIS and fracking right, they would do a cost-benefit analysis, and all of those numbers would come out and get factored into the decision as to what do we get if we frack versus what does it cost us if we frack. The LNG port, though, is going to pull glass from more than New York State. It's going to pull gas from Pennsylvania. It's going to pull it from West Virginia. It's going to pull it from Ohio. So unfortunately, while the shell thing is a very important factor in the overall decision in New York to do fracking, it's not going to be decisive in the LNG issue. The LNG issue is really going to have to turn on impacts in the harbor, better use of the money, and do we really want to commit to this kind of fossil fuel economy? Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that I forgot to say during my presentation, um, and I'm kicking myself for, is there, I, just, I had a pie chart slide, uh, and I was, I was going on about how easy it is to get an authorization to export natural gas. The Department of Energy has already approved 40% of our daily natural gas production for export overseas. So the game is almost already over on that respect. We're now just waiting to build the capacity. So we're already close approaching with all the app active applications. Half of all of the gas produced in America per day could be sent overseas. Uh, given that volume, it's not going to hit that high, at least in the short term, because it takes a while to build the facilities. But given that volume, experts are showing that uh, the United States could go, and it depends on the report, but the latest ones I've seen from about a month ago say that the United States could uh, reach price parity with the global LNG market at about 6 to $7 on average. So Japan is going to come down from 19 per unit, a million BTU, and the United States is going to go up from 3. So we're going to double, they're going to go down by 70%. And so it's looking like that, once everybody's at build out, that's going to be where, uh, where the market goes um, for that price.
Well, it's too bad that the natural gas companies haven't hired you to do a little bit of their fiscal planning because <laughs> one of the interesting things uh, that we've seen about gas fracking is there's a real Enron mentality around it and there's a real Enron mentality around these LNG things. For example, the, the prices that were cited for natural gas in Europe and Japan are because they, in those countries they peg the price of natural gas to oil that we do not do that in the United States, which is why natural gas people want to go overseas, because they would get essentially that subsidy. Now, basically the Europeans are beginning to wise up. You know, they're beginning to be things in the European spot market where they're getting away from that price. And essentially, one of the interesting debates in environmental policy is whether we would do better with a high price for energy or a low price for energy. I must confess, I'm becoming a bit of an iconoclast, and I actually think a low price might do us better because it might wipe out some of these awful projects like offshore drilling and drilling in the Arctic. And so, but it's clear that nobody's thinking this thing through beyond, hey, we got a corporate problem this year, let's sell this gas overseas, you know, we can raise bonds, blah, blah, blah. And they say they should have you doing some of their fiscal analysis for them. Sure, sure, there definitely is. Um, I know that out in Oregon, they're working with wave buoys. There's a whole suite of them out there. I know that in the East River, there's hydrokinetic uh, experiments going on. And so, so these, are the, these are the same kind of technological investments that we do need to be making. There's, uh, I read one report that said that um, wave buoys placed along the shore could power communities up and down the entire country because of the natural energy of, of waves going in and out. Um, it really, but I think the point being is that, as we've mentioned before, there's that these investments in science and technology need to be had because even these wave buoys, uh, I know that there's surfers in the house, not always going to be needed everywhere or beneficial everywhere. There's always these trade offs to be made in any sort of energy or any sort of industrialization or building whatsoever. Um, and so, but the key is, is that we need to, to investigate and we need to learn and we need to. Uh, finalize the technology in a way so that we can have the most efficient end product. So there is a lot of uh, experiment going on in, into that right now um, all over the country and I think that uh, it, hydrokinetic was taken into consideration in a report that came out just last year that said that New York State could get off of fossil fuels entirely in the next 10 years using existing off-the-shelf technology. So there, there are technologies out there that right now that can be used and can do a good job of that. Everybody should join forces because this port is in the middle of the port of New York and New Jersey. It's where the fishermen from both states go. And so it's really the impacts are, uh, you know, for, to our fisheries, to our trade, to our energy. All of these things are, are borne by both states. Um, and so that's a very uh, good question. And I think that one of the twists on that is what we heard is that either state can veto this port. And so uh, I believe you were saying earlier, who do we want to be the better environmental steward? And that race, that competition should be borne out in a competition between both states and we'll see who can do the best thing by us quickest. Yeah, so there's a couple of, this can get very technical, but there's a couple of different ways that you can do kind of turbine construction. There's the old like cement them straight into the ground, which can be harmful. The new ones are like semi-floating. So there are structures in the ground, but most of it's floating, you can move around a bit. There is going to be some damage to the ocean floor. I like, you know, you're, your building construction, it's just gonna happen. But what they've seen in Europe is that in a two to three year period, once the initial damage is done, you're actually able to bring it back and it serves as a, a, a marine, as an artificial reef it can bring back. Um, and the new, basically the new models they're using are less destructive than they were in the past. But you know, there is gonna be some impact. So we've had not quite a hurricane example, but upstate New York, there's uh, quite a bit of wind installed. And what they'll do in kind of, high wind situations that they do have to turn them off when it goes too fast and you know that protects them um, and they're able to get back running really quickly so while an older power plant actually takes some time to kick back and start like wind you know you kind of flip the switch and they're back up and running um, and so they're, they're, they're pretty resilient to sort of these high wind activities yeah I think you know I think there have been a case of like a turbine one's falling over and like if one or two it's possible, but generally they're, they're pretty large and they're, they're kind of steady and, and can hold on. So it, they're orders of magnitude larger than the ones you have actually probably seen upstate. Um, to tackle your wind question, I think one of the things that you do have to be careful, and 
one of the things that we advocate is responsibly cited wind power. And so um, you need to be working with the individual communities and making sure that people understand where it's going to be, what it's going to do, and like have those conversations. So for example, even though offshore wind is you know, 15, 30 miles offshore, I've had conversations, for example, with conservation groups in Montauk. There's a project 30 miles off the shore because we need to make sure that they understand what's at stake and that they have input on it. And so, it, I don't know the case in Massachusetts, but if you don't get that local kind of community buy-in, then of course you're going to have issues, I think. I'd like to add a supplement to that. We environmentalists are not immune from the kind of Enron mentality or from the hot fashion mentality. Um, and indeed, part of the problem with methane and natural gas is that the lots of people, I will mention no names tonight, have forgotten the first rule of being environmentalists, which is to think through all of the impacts. So that the point about planning, the same kind of planning the gas company should be doing about LNG and a realistic assessment of markets and externalities is often not done when people rush in to wind power. The other problem with wind power, and this is a bigger this is a problem that if you put it out far enough out to sea, you solve, but you don't solve on land, is unless you're Can putting it. Can you the mic closer to you? I'm sorry. Um, well, another problem with wind power is you obviously, if you're going to spend X amount of dollars on a turbine, you want to get it where the wind will blow strongest. The problem with where the wind blows strongest are often the areas that have the most impact, either visually or socially. On particular areas. So, the balancing of the economics of the wind turbines with all of these other things you just rightfully raised is something that if you rush into it, you're likely to get wrong. Well, I think you're on the really important fact. Actually, if you go down to the American Archi Institute of Architects down on, I think it's LaSalle Street next to NYU, LaGuardia. they have a heat pump. LaGuardia. LaGuardia. LaGuardia, thank you, sorry. Um, <coughs> it's the Frenchman in me, which, which actually doesn't exist, but be that as it may. They, they've got a heat pump that goes down 1,100 feet, and it's very efficient, and there's no question in my mind that if you're kind of looking for a quick set of hits in New York City, geothermal would be one of them. Yeah, and I, I think um, it was on one of my slides, and geothermal is amazing. It can actually do a lot. Um, one of the reasons that, you know, it isn't my priority, for example, not one of our top priorities, is that figuring out how to do it in a large scale that everyone can is just really difficult. Not every place, it's not every home can do it, not everything can do it, but where you can, you should be doing it and you should be working on it because it's a great option. Um, I, I, that's a very good question. I think that I, I have two answers to that. The first one is uh, very economic in nature and that's putting costs on externalities, putting costs on these things if you generate or use or there's too much um, packaging then you're gonna there's gonna be a cost that you need to pay for that and that's something that a lot of people are pushing for that's a carbon tax in some cases that's so externalities and forcing people to pay for the asthma that their power plant generates or something like that should make the system more efficient but more on the ground and achievable and feasible of an answer I think is to celebrate the people that are in the waste industry and we know plenty of people that work on, uh, oh, you're replacing that bridge? We'll take that bridge, put it on a barge, and break it down into constituent parts and resell it and make good use out of that instead of just throwing it away. And celebrating those stories and really bringing to the public's attention the, the stories of people that, that take recycling and they make it into new products, that do the e-waste uh, recycling, but that you bring that technology and that American waste to places like Africa and repurpose it for solar ovens, that kind of thing, those venture capitalist ideas, uh, celebrating those will bring to attention the wastefulness of a lot of American consumerism. Uh, and really, a, a third that just came to my mind is that, you know, as costs of energy go up, I think one of the ancillary things that we're going to see happen is that waste is going to go down as it becomes more expensive to ship a container from China to the port of, of Los Angeles. People are going to want to pack those containers with more materials and they're not going to want to put a tiny little battery in a big plastic case. And so I think that we're going to see these things even out, but by celebrating the successes of the reduction of waste, we'll be able to force that quicker and sooner. Short answer to that question is the bigger the system, the more variations you can capture and integrate. There's also a great deal of work being done on batteries, on technologies of the equivalent of pump storage. Um, it's a problem, and the poorly designed systems have been burned by it. The West Germans, the Germans, sorry, that's a 
It dates me, I'm afraid. Um, the, the Germans are struggling with the fact that they didn't design a system that dealt with those peaking issues very well. But if we have a grid, an alternate energy grid, and we look at the uh, technology, we have some very interesting experiments done, being done on the idea of using excess power to make hydrogen, which would then be stored and would fill in the gap as a clean fuel um, when, you do, when you cannot deliver this peaking. The other thing, of course, is that fortunately, in, there are some situations where when we need power, we don't get it. But for example, for the air conditioning peak, is the same peak as the solar peak. So the more we, so there are ways we can deal with this problem. Uh, one of the other things is uh, to mention is uh, conservation and efficiency. I think is a big one. It's a big answer to that question. Uh, a lot of places around the country, uh, using energy, we're pumping up groundwater to put in our toilets, to pump to sewage plants, to pump into the ocean, and we're running out of groundwater. And all of those pipes are so full of holes that they're only about 70% efficient. So there's water leaking into the whole system, the pumps need to work more, no one's replacing those pipes, and they're getting worse, and more pump needs to go, and the water's deeper, so they need to go drill farther. And so these systems that we have, um, our sewer systems in New York, some of them are made out of clay. They were built 150 years ago, for the problems of 150 years ago, and we're now looking on relying on them for 15 times the people for the next 100 years, and that's not gonna help. Conservation and efficiency, even just uh, like right now, the lights are off in my apartment and not everybody does that. Even in this room, we could probably turn off 40% of the lights above and still be able to see and talk to one another. And that's a regime shift in our society that could take the place of any need and could actually lead us to shut down a lot of these power plants to begin with. Well, as a former New York City Water Commissioner, I have to say a kind word about the New York City system, particularly given the fact that today we use 400 million gallons a day less water than we did in 1990, and the fact that, that the, not using that water has freed up an enormous amount of storage in our sewer, in our clay sewers, which are actually quite good sewers, I might add in passing. Um, which is one of the reasons we've made a lot of progress in terms of CSOs. But the point about the lighting is definitely true, but there are easy steps, again. The variability of power plants, there are answers to that. And it's a problem that definitely has to be dealt with. But a larger network, supplemental storage technologies, and the point here is that the more you conserve, the less you have to have deal with that variability you can manage the baseline. One example we have, you mentioned battery storage really briefly. People often think, oh, that's really far away. But actually, it's not. Right now on Long Island, they put out proposals for battery storage technology to handle peaking, for example. And so as the, move, the grid moves to more renewables, we do need more interconnected so that if the wind's not blowing down here, it's blowing upstate and we can bring it down or vice versa. But we also have battery storage is an option like right now and that we are investing in. So. Well, the United States military is driving the battery research because the United States military is in Las Vegas. But, that, um, but be that as it may, you're essentially saying it's variable, therefore there's no solution. We've told you that there are solutions that, but as I said, the biggest thing is to have a net. Have a network where you can change power, play with your storage, and pull this together. I, you know, I'm sure you think you've got a good source for the conclusion that all batteries have been shut down, but it's not consistent with the information I have. Yeah, I'm going to admit it's not my forte, so I'm, I'll go out on a limb though, but, you know, just part of having renter, a lot of renter-occupied units, it's just very hard for renters to convince their landlords to make these kind of investments in it. It's not to say that we shouldn't try. I know, like, SolarRise Brooklyn is doing an incredible job, for example, and we should be supporting these organizations. And I know like co-ops are doing really cool things and there is a real potential there. It's just going to take some time. And if we want to get to where we need to get to quickly to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to need both options. Kind of your large scale power plant style renewables as well as a small scale. But it's, it's tougher in New York City than it is, say, out on Long Island. Well, the, worldwide there's a lot of agitation for alternate fuel. Germany and Denmark have been leading the way in Europe. But the fossil fuel industry, as I said, is a $600 billion industry, and that's not all in <clears throat> the United States. The best thing the United States could probably do is demonstrate, as they're 
there begin to be some rate cases where they actually find solar is cheaper than natural gas. The best thing the United States can do is design a really nifty program of renewables that can be taken overseas. Because one of the things they're continuing to use fossil fuel overseas for is to fill in the gaps with renewables. And we have to show you don't need that. Either. But one of the one of the dangers that is something that we have to start addressing now with legislation and with education for our children is that this is these are finite resources. And as they become more expensive, they will become more and more in demand by whoever has the money. And so you know, starting good programs now is, is vital to the outcome. We weren't seeing calls for crude oil, petroleum products, or natural gas or coal exports 50 years ago. Uh, we are now. There's less and less and less and less of it. And as it gets more and more expensive, it's going to be harder to do just that. So that's why we need to get started now on a big scale. Well, yeah, the, so the Clean Water Act, I think, I think the relevant point here is that um, the laws that we have that run everything that goes on are very antiquated. For example, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, these were written before we had iPhones, before they could measure how much effluent comes out of a power plant remotely. And so they were set up in a way that was supposed to get us fishable, swimmable waters by 1985. Uh, it's, not, it's not anywhere close to that around the country and it's getting worse. We have many, many more people, the same laws, they all need to be updated, and they all need to. Uh, there needs to be a fresh look taken. We early eight, early on in the Clean Water Act, a lot of money was provided to upgrade sewage plants around the country, POTWs, and it was because it was seen as a problem that we all shared that there's a lot more people generating a lot more sewage, and we need a lot more investment in infrastructure. Uh, we could definitely use something like that again. We could definitely use a nationwide reinvestment in the infrastructure. Uh, that we have before us today. After Sandy, one of the biggest things that come out was that you know there's 70 billion dollars in infrastructure need in the Sandy impacted area just in wastewater infrastructure, more in bridges and roads and, and telecom and all of those things. And so the infrastructure approach used to be what we did with these laws. Let's let's permit what's going on, cap it, slowly reduce it by forcing technology and research and investment. Unfortunately, we have what we have and everybody keeps adding their limited programs and we don't do research, we don't do technology, we don't do investment. So it's something that really needs to be taken a look at again and that's something hopefully that um, Congress will tackle this term. Oh wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll take a stab at some of that. Um, so you're, we're bringing up something, I'll, I'll address it kind of straightforward. Chesapeake Energy, the Sierra Club was working with them to wind energy mainly, but also natural gas, because this is before the fracking boom, when natural gas was kind of thought as a bridge fuel. That was under a different um, executive director, and the board has really changed since then and taken things in a, in a totally different direction. Um, and so, it is part of our past, I can't, you know, I wasn't here at the time, and it is what it is. Um, in terms of, of where we get our money now, you know, We've made sure that, for example, we're not taking gobs of money from wind developers. We had an offshore wind forum on Long Island, and there was a discussion of, like, how do we pay for this thing? And, you know, someone was like, oh, well, the wind developer might be able to pay for the whole thing. And we're like, no, that's not okay. We're not in their pockets, and they're going to be able to dictate our agenda that way. And so we're making sure that we're trying to do this without, with as little influence from kind of big companies as, as we can. Um, and we've also been working with the, the both the state chapter really closely. We have actually a couple of folks here from the state chapter. Um, there's Goosey and Lisa DiCaprio, I know for sure, maybe a couple of folks I didn't see. And so we've been working very closely with them to make sure that um, we're working in concert, for example, because the state chapter has been a leader um, in the fracking movement before National caught on. And so they've been really great and a great resource. And I know I tend to mo do most of my work on Long Island, it's where I live. Um, and the Long Island chapter is like 100% on board with this wind initiative and they've really been a, a strong supporter of it. Um, there's been some dancing with wolves in the environmental movement. There's no doubt about that. And the, I think the Sierra Club has less to be ashamed of than some other people I could mention. Um, for example, if you look at the League of Conservation Voters list of donors, um, the, you know, it gets to be a bit of an embarrassment. Um, the, uh, 
It's very, it's very, very tough. You can't fight a war without an army, and you can't, you can't, armies might turn their stomachs. And basically, at the end of the day, we need to convert the business community and not stay in a position of, you know, total, you know, always this with them. Um, but as long as voices like yours are out there, I think we will, we will do better on this issue. I think many people, um, organizations we all know the names of have been seriously embarrassed by what was a very skillful um, PR campaign by the gas fracking industry. Um, somebody said, you know, we have to be realistic about fossil, uh, the fossil fuel people. We don't have to be realistic about them in that way, but we definitely have to be realistic about the fact that nobody is planning to give up $600 billion worth of wealth without being carried out of the room. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, where I have many colleagues and friends, the state legislature is a wholly owned subsidiary of the gas fracking industry, um, which I'm not saying here for the first time. I've said in public in Pennsylvania, and to a lot of applause. The, we have to win this, you know, we have to win this battle. We have to have clarity of purpose. We cannot fight among ourselves. We must all be patient. Um, I think at the end of the day, the Sierra Club rescued itself from what could have been an embarrassing situation. And I think the New York chapter deserves a fair amount of credit for putting that pressure on them. Well, um, the, the history of third parties in the United States, sadly, is not a particularly good one. Uh, but on the other hand, it is definitely true that the vote is one of our biggest weapons and it should be used. Uh, it should be used creatively. Now, but I do think at the end, um, one, of the one of the most important things is it's not just enough to vote against somebody because they haven't done something. We need to have some clarity of what we want. We need to convey what we want. And the, to, I have a lot of people who tell me it's not realistic to say we can walk away from fossil fuel. I like to say it's not realistic to say we can't um, because of the long-term consequences of it. So the legitimacy of these, what's going on politically if you kind of look at the natural gas thing, it indulge me for 30 seconds here, it's important you understand this. I think part of the reason there's a natural gas is so popular among the centrist class is they're desperate to do something about global warming. And that it looks like you've got natural gas and you're substituting it for coal and you can link it to maybe lower CO2 emissions. That looks like you've done something. I mean, basically, the pe many of the people who are advocating natural gas say this is a great strategy for global warming. Ignoring the fact that, first of all, the methane leakage probably makes it counterproductive. And ignoring the fact, second, that we're taking billions of dollars we're going to be putting into renewables and putting it into natural gas. It's very important that the public understand that this is not a global warming strategy. That once you add everything up, natural gas is part of the problem. It's not part of the solution. So it's very important that intelligent people like you stand by that premise. They do not buy into this kind of cheap scorekeeping about global warming. Global warming is a strategic problem, and the strategy has got to be renewables over fossil fuel. Oh. Appropriate. <laughs> I'll add something else to that, and that's that um, most politicians that get to be president or mayor or governor start out smaller. And so there's lots and lots of elections that happen every day, well not every day, every election day, um, all over the country that can impact the future starting out small. Everything from a school board um, elected official who institutes uh, a program where the students learn how to do green gardens and rainwater infrastructure projects and that gets translated to what the mayor wants to do with the city the next year and that gets translated to what the county is going to approach uh, in terms of their policy and then you're training a new crew of students and you're, you're building a community that way from the ground up. So don't discount the small scale politics that sometimes don't, it doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat or some other party, it's about what the good ideas are and the ones that save money and a lot of times those are green. <laughs>